But yeah, and I know what you're talking about, about having to be like the only person who like disagrees with stuff. It's a special burden that I don't like to have. I, a lot of times I'm like, I'm not the only... I can't be the only person who feels this way. Like, why do I gotta be the first person that says it? And it turns out that, you know, it, I don't like it either. Yeah. On behalf of a yes person, I thank you for your contrarian attitude, because I definitely am somebody who <laughs> doesn't say the thing. I struggle. I struggle <laughs> with it, so... <laughs> I usually say like, all right, let's crash and burn. Who cares? I'm going to say it. Yeah, it's kind of like the attitude <laughs> that I usually have. <laughs> yeah. Um, There's an entrepreneurial, like it's one of these like startup hokey dokey things that you do a postmortem, like you as a group brains, like go to the, like, okay, everything has failed. Why? Even before it's failed <laughs> to get people to actually talk about what their real fears are. Um, because like, if you're talking about implementing something to work towards a project, nobody actually wants to offer that, like, but what about this thing? Um, yeah, I've tried doing that to get me to start owning my fears and, um, yeah, it just feels so precarious when you're building something to to then throw in a a fear in there or a doubt or a, you know lose that momentum. Right. I think and it's yeah, also because like, well, in co-ops, right? It's like, like I was just thinking about that. Like, what was that? Impact Hub Tokyo, I think, had that. I mean, everybody does it, I'm sure, but they had their fuck up Friday or whatever it was. And um and it was a totally cool idea. On the other hand, it's like if you're one person and you're or two or three people and you take a shot at something and it blows up and you go on to the next thing, it's easier to process it's easier to have that conversation than if you're a group of like twenty people who invested the only money that you got in the world and just killed yourselves with sweat equity and worked for years and then the thing dies miserably and you hate each other <laughs> like, like there's different there's postmortems and there's postmortems right so i think there's like uh it's because i was just thinking to myself yeah this is so right but why in the co-op like, i never hear co-op postmortems of that type occasionally there are articles here and there but not very frequent and i think it's just because there's a whole lot more uh in part it's because there's so much invested in it i mean yeah and that's hard, but it's, I don't know. I think it's a good point. We totally should do that. I had a good talk with Jim Johnson the other day about this co-op here, Organic Gardens, which was a landscaping co-op that had a brilliant business model, no problem. And yet because of the, how they, it was a conversion and how they got started, et cetera, they weren't able to gel the solidarity group at the core of it that would sustain them. And so personal conflicts killed them and but luckily they were able to de they were able to you know close out the co-op um in a pretty comradely and sort of organized way so it was a very that transition actually was kind of a good story it was you know it's a bummer it doesn't exist but yeah. it didn't fail because it was a bad idea or because it's not possible or anything like that just sometimes it just doesn't stick together and just didn't so i don't know i do well, feel like that's that probably is a good story to tell and get out there right because yeah yeah you should because we you wrote the story about them starting and getting converted <laughs> to a worker co-op or starting that in the first place so uh yeah, yeah it'd be good to get that whole uh thing because we do like to talk a lot about how you know worker co-ops have a better success rate than traditional businesses and it's definitely true but yeah. it doesn't mean that they all work out and it doesn't mean that, they, you know, they, uh, that there aren't problems. And, you know, I think about it, like, you know, if one take the since at least three of us are Americans here, we must use military metaphors. It's like they have something called the after action report. Right. I mean, you go, you're 
you just got oh, great. went out on your patrol or whatever and a bunch of guys come back shot up you do an after action report you gotta you know do your debrief and figure out what the heck went wrong and if you know we did never do that it's you're just asking for problems um and it's kind of the same thing with you know when doing was saying you know when you're starting a project you don't want to be like uh, kind of bringing the energy down by pointing you know bringing in the fears and the what ifs but on the other hand it's the same kind of thing it's like well if you're plan if you yeah, fail to yeah. think about that it's like you know buying a house and like oh well what if there's a fire should we get fire insurance oh don't i don't want to think about that you know it's <laughs> a yeah. bummer it's yeah. like you you, you you we need to do that uh you know kind of stuff and we need to you know when we fail or things don't go right i think you know it's it's so important to do that and you're right not many people do um uh, some people who did who i'd like to just point out is the uh, renaissance food co-op uh, they, you know, put a lot of effort into that, uh, you know, it was kind of ran for a couple of years, I think, and then kind of petered out and, uh, Ed Whitfield and, um, can't remember the other, uh, a woman who was involved in that did a really good, uh, kind of postmortem on a podcast about that and talked a lot about it. Um, but yeah, huh. I think we do, we need a lot more of that, right. The, the sharing, uh, stories. So Chris, so how much of this problem is, is the nonprofit? influence because i just feel like in the co-op mm -hmm. when i think of co-ops developing there there isn't such a strong hype logic to them like it, it's it's just you, you need to promote yourself to the people who could be customers and other people in your ecosystem but you don't have to hype yourself up because that's not really very helpful but i think any of the projects i think of that are super hypey are the ones that are going after grant funding Mm -hmm. or outside investors right they're, they're looking for money mm -hmm. so they have to be the mm -hmm. coolest sexiest thing in the world right is that just my bias or is that uh, uh does anybody else want to answer i certainly have a <laughs> response i was just just feeding the lion right there you want a big piece of steak josh okay <laughs> Yeah, that's. I think you put your finger right on it, Matt. Just grab that third rail there. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, because this is. <laughs> it's. I don't think anybody wants to talk about. It. I will say this. I will not mention any names. Uh, but I once saw a planning document for a nonprofit that's involved in a lot of worker co-op development from when they were starting their nonprofit. And I was not supposed to see this, uh, but I did. It was leaked, and as it were. Um, and the plan for this nonprofit was to set up some worker co-ops, get some worker co-ops set up, and then use those worker co-ops as PR to pitch their services to other places who wanted to build worker co-ops. Um, but from the planning document, it was clear that the purpose of starting the worker co-ops was to serve the nonprofit's revenue, you know, funding, you know, to serve their funding needs. Not like it wasn't, <laughs> for the benefit of the workers right and another thing that's just like uh, worker co-ops are for right for workers should be you would think set up by workers it seems weird to have an outside group coming in and you know setting up something for your benefit but in this case it was very clear from their documents that the thought process and i don't think there was necessarily anything nefarious going on here it's just nonprofit people thinking like nonprofit people this is how you, you know, is how they uh, were thinking. So yeah, it's, they have that, uh, you know, that the necessity to pitch themselves uh, as, as being successful or pitch themselves as being able to do, you know, impressive things in order to get the impressive amounts of money from uh, the funders. And we've seen it in New York City, where, you know, there's, uh, been some pretty fast and loose kind of, uh, you know, talk about, you know, the numbers and how many uh, worker co-ops were actually formed with the money that the uh, the city um, devoted to worker co-op development. Uh, and again, it's this touchy itch issue where on the one hand, we want there to still be money for worker co-op development. So we don't want to like be messing up that money flow. But on the other hand, we don't want to just be kind of looking the other way if a lot of 
uh, you know, development efforts that aren't working well or co-ops that are being claimed as co-ops, but they aren't, they're not actually co-ops. They are more kind of aspirational. They thought about it, you know, um, but there are these um, incentives for nonprofits specifically to be uh, misleading about the success of their efforts and things like that. And for me, a big red flag is when there's a lack of transparency. And we definitely have seen that with a lot of the bigger co-op projects. Like when you, when co-op researchers, not like people like me or geo who are, might like publish this, you know, uh, publicly, but like people who are like, you know, going to maintain your confidentiality go and has to just like take a look at the numbers and they like uh uh no 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 like to me that's a big red flag and that's uh certainly heard those kind of stories from some places so um. i wouldn't say that co-ops don't need hype though i mean yeah you want you want people to support your business over another business if you're relying on customers you want your services to be seen as reliable and you want to be known like we're trying to hype ourselves up <laughs> we would love more support getting our name out there as like more municipalities need environmental consultants you know like i think i think there is i mean and and we really value the role that these co-op associations have played in hyping us up in letting other organizations know about our existence when they need our services. So I, yeah, I don't know. And I, I agree, like, I think any grant that is dependent on number of co-ops developed, I think is a wrong metric to gauge whether or not you're being effective by, because like, you know, sometimes a co-op model isn't the right model for what a group is trying to do. And you as somebody who is trying to organized should not be shoehorned into creating co-ops and like forcing people to down this you know legally incorporate path um and at the same time like there is a lot of organizing that needs to be done and it's really great if it can be if that work can be supported financially by people who have or like you know organizations that are trying to achieve the same like social outcomes as what we're trying to organize for you know like i had a i had an interesting conversation with a union organizer who was like ah the co-op movement's really annoying because they're expecting workers to like you know find the time to make a business when they're already strapped and they're like having to manage all of these different priorities and it's really hard to organize a business so like we need to go in there and help them freaking organize like he's like i hate it like go up people think want too much from us kind of thing <laughs> it's really interesting um so yeah i don't know there's there's obviously like so many different sides to everything but Thank you.